I'm going to share first uh, some thoughts about what we're reading this morning. And uh, so those who are interested and just want to have a reference, our Torah reading this morning begins on page 517 in the Machsor. As always, uh, on Yom Kippur morning, we chant from Leviticus chapter 16, which has the details of the various sacrifices, mostly the offerings, the different rituals that are done in the Mishkan, the portable sanctuary, eventually the temple, the Beit HaMikdash, um, by the priesthood uh, on behalf of, of all the people of, of Klal Yisrael, the, the Jewish people or the, the, the Israelites. And we have this peculiar thing that we come to each time, which is there is at one point, there are two goats that are brought forward and one of them, and lots are drawn, like as if, you know, straws are drawn or whatever it might be. And one of the lots is for Adonai and the other lot is for Azazel. And so as many are familiar, the one who draws the lot for Azazel, that goat actually stays alive and eventually the high priest puts his hand on the goat and confesses all of the the sins, all of the, the wrongdoings of the people of Israel and then eventually that goat is sent out by a designated person out uh, into this... Uh, Eretz Gzeira, this cut off land, this wild place, this removed place, this wilderness. And uh, this figure, Azazel, is seen by uh, many commentators as, uh, as a demon, as a demon figure, actually, and it's not like a fringe thing. Some of the classical commentators say this is a, this is a particular demon by the name of Azazel. Some connect him with this other demon by the name of Samael, which are sort of these I don't know, fallen angels or demon figures or whatever. And it, it, it may seem really um, like this hooky kind of thing that is, um, but it's really something that you see in the tradition if you, if you open up. And one of the ways of seeing it, which is very, makes a lot of sense, is it's a, uh, it's a leftover from pre-Israelite religion, from pagan practices, um, maybe more earth-based practices where there are these ver- various deities and the Torah is, is filled with those. You can see this throughout, sort of these vestiges of, of what came before. And there's one Midrash that says, well, this goat that is sent out to Azazel, this is a bribe to persuade Azazel not to testify against the people of Israel. Or it's a distraction to keep him from, him, from his evil work. And uh, I, that's not that compelling to me, that reading. But, uh, but I actually find myself thinking more and more about this notion of, of demons and what does it mean for us to understand Azazel as a demon. And this was opened up a lot for me actually from uh, my friend, colleague, Rabbi Genevieve Granitz, who was one of the teachers. I spoke on Rosh Hashanah about the meditation retreat I, I was on this, sum- this uh, summer and she was one of the teachers and she gave this beautiful teaching really beautiful teaching that was referencing a lot of rabbinic discussion about demons, actually. And she gave this, I thought, really wise reading of how we might understand the demons in our lives. And I wanted to share some of that. So she references a conversation that's happening in the Talmud. It's a conversation about prayer, just about different ways of prayer. And suddenly, this uh, character, this guy named Abba Binyamin, he, uh, he comes in and he, he, he just interjects into this conversation about prayer. He said, if the eye was given permission to see, no creature would be able to withstand the abundance and ubiquity of the demons all around us and continue to live unaffected by them. So Abba Binyamin is sort of like this figure who comes out of nowhere. You know, who knows what Abba Binyamin has to say. But then Abaye, who's sort of more of a, more of a mainstream uh, rabbi, he's in the mix. He stepped forward and he says, yes, the demons are more numerous than we humans are. And they stand over us like mounds of earth surrounding a pit. And then Rav Huna, who's also one of the, the, the heavy hitters of the rabbinic crowd, he says, each and every one of us has a thousand demons to our left and 10,000 to our right. So the other thing that Rabbi Genevieve shared were there's these rituals that the rabbis talk about, ways in which you can see the demons or, or at least see their trace. And... Uh, And one of them is this, that one who seeks to see them should take the afterbirth of a firstborn female black cat, born to a firstborn female black cat, burn it in a fire, grind it, and place the dust of it in his eyes, and he will see them. So for those who are not familiar, I do want to say the rabbis are funny. They... (laughs) 
the, I, we, we have this notion that they're very serious, but they're not. I mean, they tell fart jokes. They like really actually have a lot of fun. And so I don't know what the rabbis are literally saying, but I don't think that they're really, really taking all this literally about the ritual to see the demons. I think they're saying something more, and that's what Rabbi Genevieve was suggesting. And this is what she says. I'll, I'll quote her a little bit. She says, even while the sages are telling us all about the demons infiltrating our universe, there's a gentleness, a gentleness, she says. There is certainly no thought to slay the demons or to overcome them or be rid of them. We don't even have to see them. The Talmud is just inviting us to be aware, to know that here we are, praying, sitting, being, and demons of all kinds are surrounding us. But our text teaches that there's no problem with the existence of these demons. These difficult emotions, monstrous memories, tendencies like greed, aversion, lust, hateful self-talk, which isn't to say that we need to like them or that we should like them. This is not a look on the bright side, hey, you know, this is all, let's just like make the most of the demons. <laughs> it's, this is what is here and how do we work with it most effectively? That's really how I receive these teachings. What actually helps us to suffer less from and perhaps in ways liberate ourselves and each other from the difficulties, the suffering, that we might call demon. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story of the Buddha's enlightenment. It's told in, in, in Buddhist tradition, the, the Buddha or the uh, Prince uh, Siddhartha in the last night of, of his enlightenment is sitting under the Bodhi, Bodhi tree all night and his final obstacle is this demon named Mara who comes with all kinds of temptations and all kinds of distractions. And the Buddha's response is, I see you, Mara. I see you, Mara. And welcomes Mara with a, an inviting presence, inviting him for tea, serving him as an honored guest. And that was the last phase to the Buddha's enlightenment. And as, as I offer this and connect this to what we're reading, it's not, it's not Pollyannish. It's not to say, oh, we should be able to just open the door wide and just let all that's difficult in. I'm really, really not saying that. Each of us to our own tolerance. Maybe just a crack to perceive more closely because what I really want to say and I, what I really receive from what these teachings offer is what we can identify and recognize has so much less power over us. What we can identify and recognize and perceive clearly has so much less power over us. We suffer less from it. So this ritual that we have, our, our ancestors, I think, had this, this impulse. Uh, and I think in a sense, they probably held it more collectively, I think, that there's this like obviously threatening uh, demon-like figure out in this cut-off land that might threaten their livelihood and threaten their safety. And in a certain sense, this ritual is to say, we're sending this out. We, we know that you are there. And what I was saying this morning, actually, for those who weren't here, was talking a little about this, the, the stone that the builders refused will be the storner, cornerstone. For me, is really this teaching about how much these days are about not banishing not banishing really anything within us. Because the thing is when we banish, when we resist, when we ignore, some way or another it comes back around. Some way or another it comes back around, often in a more difficult fashion. And so in a sense, it's like the gesture, the, the posture toward the demon is, I, I'm not going to follow you. I'm not going to listen to you. But you are welcome to stay. You are welcome here. Have a seat. Have some tea. Here's a goat. <laughs> I'm going to continue with my life now. And I want to be careful about applying this too broadly 
uh, there, are, there are ways in the world of asiya, as we say, in the world of the, you know, the, 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 the physical world, in the very real practical world that we need, obviously, to protect ourselves. I really want to be clear that I'm not saying we should just be able to you know, let everything in. That's not at all what I'm saying, whether indiv individually or collectively, obviously. What I'm, what I'm saying in addition to that is that there's so much that we attack that's actually not helpful. It's actually not helping us. It's actually not making us safer. I mean, think about the term demonize. We use that term demonize. What does it mean to demonize someone or demonize a group of people? In some way, we're, 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 it means to malign, to dismiss, that we really want to eradicate that person or those people or that thing. And what if demonize instead, we could shift that when we're tempted to demonize and simply say, we, we see you. We're not going to follow you, but we're not going to invest energy in attacking you either. And again, I, I think we could be talking on, on, on multiple levels here, external and internal. I think in particular on the internal level, I find this to be an enormously helpful practice. And this way we might live with greater freedom and well-being when we can identify and recognize and even, even befriend, perhaps, or at least, as Rabbi Genevieve said, with a gentleness, that it has so much less power, so much less potential to cause us suffering. The last thing I want to say, Rabbi Genevieve gave this beautiful connection. She said the being on retreat of spending time in silence and practice and paying attention to what is, that's like, that's like putting the ashes on our eyes because we do see that so much arises that's difficult, that's painful. It's like we do see maybe what we didn't see before. And I think maybe Yom Kippur and maybe this season is a little like that too. When we really look, we in, look within and it's like, oh wow, this thing that I've been sort of blaming this other person for this whole time I've had this story about and it's like, oh wow, maybe I really, maybe I was really afraid or maybe I was really actually not seeing things from their perspective. Maybe I was being hard-hearted. And so when we see What do we do then? And the invitation is that we approach with great compassion and gentleness and trust that whichever demons we find, they are but one piece of the whole of who we are. And they can coexist with the beauty and the joy and the gratitude. So may we feel supported and held in all of this. Amen.